Well, we can't have church today in person, so because the uh, parking lot is very icy and we want, we're very concerned about safety for you all, but um, I thought I would provide a Christmas uh, devotion and sing a song, we'll take communion, and I'll talk about my first sermon out of our new series in the book of Matthew. So let's pray. Father, be with us as we worship you and be with me as I sing and also uh, read your word and try to explain it. Let everybody be edified and encouraged and Lord, you be praised. It's in Jesus' name, amen. All right, it's Christmas Day on Sunday. I wish every Christmas was on Sunday. Um, and the next time this will happen, will be 11 years from now. So let's sing this song. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin mother and child, holy but so tender and mild sleep in heavenly peace sleep in heavenly peace every sunday churches practice this different in terms of their frequency but every Sunday, we offer communion to all believers. Uh, you don't have to be a member of our church if you're tuning in online. We want you to join us. And so um, communion, uh, the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper the night before he died. And he took bread and he said, this is my body. And he took the cup and he said, this is my blood. So we eat this bread and drink this uh, fruit of the vine, this grape juice, in remembrance of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. So if you have some grape juice and some bread, um, I hope you'll join me. All right, today we begin our new series from the book of Matthew. And Matthew was inspired by the Holy Spirit, written by Matthew. Uh, his name is Levi, Matthew. It was written sometime before AD 70, I know for sure, but many people believe it's from 60 to 65 AD. And it was written primarily to Jewish people. Uh, to Jews and for Gentiles like us. And his purpose is to demonstrate, to show, to prove that Jesus is the Messiah and the King. And the King, Jesus and his kingdom is emphasized all the way through uh, the book of Matthew. So I've titled this series through the book of Matthew, Jesus and his kingdom. And I think uh, a key verse is Matthew 5, verse number 17, which says, Do not think that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I haven't come to destroy them. I've come to fulfill them. And then he goes on to say, Heaven and earth will pass away, but not the smallest letter or the least stroke of the pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. And... Um, and so Matthew begins with a genealogy. It's a long genealogy. Look at verse number one, and I hope you use your Bibles and follow along with me. This is the genealogy. You can see the word Genesis in that. That's the account of his origin, uh, how he is traced, his human ancestry is traced. Uh, of Jesus the Messiah. The word Messiah means anointed one. And um, it's Christ, Jesus Christ. Christ is not his last name. 
It means Messiah, anointed one. He is anointed prophet, priest, and king. The son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham um, refers to his race as a Jewish person. I'm a Gentile, and he is Jewish. Traces his lineage all the way back to Abraham. And the son of David, and uh, that is his royal line through David. So we begin with this long genealogy, and I'm going to attempt to read it. Beginning with verse number two, Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amminadab. Amminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah the Hittite. Solomon, whose mother had been the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jerem, um, Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amnon. Am, Amnon, Ammon, that's how you say it, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the exile in Babylon. After the exile in Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel was the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel was the father of of Abihud. Abihud was the father of Eliakim. El Eliakim was the father of Azor. Azor was the father of Zadok. Zadok was the father of Achim. Achim was the father of Elihud. Elihud was the father of Eliezer. Eliezer was the father of Methan. Methan. Methan was the father of Jacob, and Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called Messiah. And you say, um, why this long list of names, you know? <laughs> you may have even said, you know, like, I can't believe he's reading this, but those names are going to be on the test after the sermon. <laughs> but why, why does he do this genealogy? Um, you know, for us, genealogies are matters of, I mean, it's just out of curiosity. Like on um, my mother's side, um, I was told that my great grandfather married Cherokee. And, uh, and then on my father's side, I, I know this to be true, that Uncle Dyke Garrett, my great-great-uncle, uh, baptized Devil Ants Hatfield. That's Jeannie and Susan and I's only claim to fame, you know. So I'm interested in that. I joined Ancestry.com, and I did the DNA test, and I'm waiting for my results. When I was studying this months ago, that's where I got the idea and I found out that Todd Meadows, he did his DNA test, and this is how it came back. 48% French, 25% English, 
24% Scottish and 1% Hebrew or Middle, East, Middle Eastern. So that's really interesting. And for us, it's just a matter of curiosity, but for the Jews, it was absolutely essential. That's why there are so many genealogies in the Old and there are several in the New Testament. You know, Matthew's genealogy is a descending genealogy. It goes from Abraham and descends to David and then goes to Joseph and to Jesus. And then Luke's is the reverse. It's an ascending genealogy. It starts with Jesus and goes back through Mary and it's a lot longer. You know, you know, one begins with Jesus and the other ends with Jesus. It goes both ways. And no matter which one you're looking at, it comes out to one person. And that is Jesus Christ. And that is verification that Jesus is the son of Abraham and the son of David. We may think we may skip right over this, but for the Jews, this was absolutely essential because anybody who was making the claim that they are the Messiah and the King, the eternal King, then they would have to show their pedigree to, to prove it. And uh, it, it, it is amazing how this has been preserved and how all of the records have been destroyed. Yeah, that's right. There is no one today that could verify that they can trace their ancestry all the way back, you know, to biblical times, all the way back to David. And that means that Jesus is the only person who can make that believable claim because we have no other records, but Matthew and Luke record it. It's kind of like, um, verification or authentication. Like when I sign in to my um, email at Marshall, I am asked whether or not I would like to, it's called two-factor verification or authentication. And I'm, I'm asked before I sign into that email, it wants to make sure that it's me that whether I'd like a phone call or a text message, and I always do the text message, and it sends me a code to my phone, and then I put that code in the computer, and then it opens up the email because it verifies, it, it authenticates my identity. Well, that's a two-factor authentication. Jesus, there are 332 prophecies in the Old Testament. So Jesus has a 332 factor authentication. I mean, it boggles my mind to think about nobody else could ever claim to be the Messiah because they would have to be the son of Abraham, the son of David, born in Bethlehem and on and on. We'll talk about that in a minute. But this is absolutely essential the way Matthew begins his gospel with the genealogy and he, he telescopes it. He teles and writers do that, you know, telescopes genealogy. That's what uh, D.A. Carson explains. There's a 400 year gap between some of those. So he's, he's chosen it, but it's common. In fact, he begins by saying he's the son of Abraham, the son of David. That's not the immediate son, but there's a direct line back to them. And so he chooses 14. And uh, he says in verse number 17, there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile in Babylon and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. So I, um, I made a little PowerPoint here, <laughs> you know, for you. And you can see from Abraham down to David, there are 14. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 14 fathers from Abraham to David. 
And then there are 14, he says, from Solomon um, to uh, Jeconiah. So let's count them. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And he's an interesting fellow. I'll have to say something about Jeconiah in a minute. And then from Shealtiel all the way down to uh, um, the remainder part of the genealogy of Jesus, there are not 14, but he lists 13. Uh, fathers, uh, human fathers. Watch this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. You say, well, wait a minute. What? What? Have, all of these are fathers, but Joseph is not his father. God is his father. Mary is his mother. God is the father. Of Jesus. It's amazing the detail uh, that is in this genealogy. Um, for instance, this guy Jeconiah in Jeremiah chapter 22, it says that Jeconiah can never, uh, his descendants will not sit on the throne. He only reigned about three months and he was a bad king. Then they went off into Babylonian captivity. But um, you say, now wait a minute. Jeconiah is in the lineage of Jesus, but you got to remember that this genealogy is traced through Joseph, who is not his physical father. It's his legal father because he adopted Jesus. But it's not it. God is his father. If you want to look at his line, both Mary and Joseph go all the way back, Abraham and David. Um, and, uh, and Jeconiah is not because uh, Mary's, the genealogy in Luke, um, it's not traced through Solomon. It's traced through Nathan, another one of David's sons. There are so many things like that in that genealogy that uh, have filled my heart, you know, and just kind of verified my faith. It's like a 332 you know, factor authentication. Nobody could ever fulfill all of these prophecies uh, other than Jesus Christ. It's impossible. I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And Matthew proves it. Uh, and that's just the beginning. <laughs> you know, he, he talks about other prophecies and, um, but there's one more thing I want to say about this genealogy. And I want you to notice that most of the genealogies, you know, they just include the fathers. But he selected four women, of course, Mary. And then he selected three other women. This is, I mean, there's grace in this genealogy, you know. It just leaks out if you study it and you look at it. It leaked out all over me, all over my desk. Um, but anyway, um, this woman, Tamar, you know who she is? You read her story? Tamar was the mother of Perez and his twin brother, but Judah was his father. Tamar is actually his daughter-in-law who dressed up like a prostitute and Judah hired her and slept with her and had two sons. He didn't realize, he thought it was just another prostitute. It was his daughter-in-law. And then, I mean, you talk about scandalous. You know, if you look at your family tree, in every family tree, there's nuts. <laughs> so, and then there's Ruth. And you say, Ruth was a lovely woman. She's a wonderful woman. Yes, she was. But she descended from Moabites, which is the result of the incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughters. And the Moabites were enemies of the Israelites. And then there's Bathsheba. You know her. 
she committed adultery with David. Of course, it's, you know, David has so much, the power differential there was, but she slept with David and they had their first son died as a result of their sin. And, um, and David committed mur murder and adultery. So you see, um, there's a lot of dysfunction in Jesus's family tree. Is there a lot of dysfunction in your family? You know, your family may influence you, but it doesn't determine you. God brings great things out of dysfunctional families, including Jesus Christ. And you can be the turning point if you receive him as your Lord and Savior and you follow him. Well, there are so many other things, but I must move on. And um, in verse number 18, we learn about the virgin birth of Jesus and um, or the conception of Jesus. Mary had never been with Joseph or any other man. And the Holy Spirit, um, you know, she conceived by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph was going to quietly put her away. But uh, an angel visited him and said, don't do that. This is a son of God. And so take her as your wife. And all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Jesus didn't just come and speak of God. Jesus is God, fully God. In him, the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And uh, so the virgin conceived, but the prophecy was he had to be born in Bethlehem. And you say, well, how did he get to Bethlehem? Well, um, if you read Luke chapter 2, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census, census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everybody had to go to their own town to register. And so that's how um, Joseph and Mary um, traveled to Bethlehem and to fulfill the prophet, uh, prophecy that was made in Micah chapter 5. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. You know, Caesar Augustus was ruling, but God was in charge. Rome took a census every 14 years, you know, um, for military and tax purposes, and Jewish men returned to the city of their fathers, how they traced their family, um, their family genealogy, their line. And since Joseph belonged to the tribe of Judah and was from the line of David, he had to go back to the hometown of David, which is Bethlehem. And there he would report his occupation, his property, and, and his family. And Caesar did that, you know, for military and tax purposes. So God used Caesar all the way in Italy. And, and he issued this decree that a census should be taken. And that caused Joseph to take Mary, who was nine months pregnant, all the way down to Bethlehem. Now, I can't imagine what it was like, you know, for Joseph and Mary to make that trip. But they were just like so obscure. They were just like, nobody knew them. And, you know, like people like Mary and Joseph and Zachariah and Elizabeth, all those people that God worked through, they were nobodies in the first century. But Caesar Augustus and Quirinius, they were powerful and everybody knew them. But today we name our children, Joseph, Mary, Zach, Elizabeth, Peter, James, and John. And we name our dog Nero or Caesar. We don't even name our cat Quirinius. We don't even know who that guy is. You know, God is a big God that uses little people. And sometimes, you know, you can feel so insignificant and you feel like a nobody. Jesus came for you. God uses people like you and me. And um, 
And I think that's a real important lesson for you to remember on Christmas. Christmas can be a lonely time. And maybe some of your family is gone and your friends are gone and you're lonely, but the Lord is with you and the Lord loves you. And he uses, he uses you in ways that you can't ever imagine. I don't think any of these little people knew that the big God was using them in a big way. Same is true with you. So everybody went home their own to their own town. And um, now imagine today if the government said, okay, we're gonna take a census and you have to go back to your hometown. Well, I would have to go to Madison and Kim would have to go to Columbus and we would crisscross all the way across this nation and we would be complaining about the price, price, price gouging in the hotels and the high cost of fuel and delays in the restaurants and the heavy traffic on the, on the highways and slow lines in the government offices. Joseph was from Bethlehem, so he had to go all the way down 80 miles. I can't imagine. Keep in mind, he did not have, uh, you know, unemployment. He was self-employed as a carpenter, you know. When um, Shana and Tori uh, had their baby, you know, uh, that's something to be able to travel, be like traveling from here to Marmat on the other side or uh, further. And, um, and old Joseph, you know, like Ben, uh, he had, you know, three months of uh, paternity leave, you know, but Joseph didn't have any of that. No unemployment, no personal days, no paternity leave. And um, they were poor, they were peasants. And the most difficult thing is Mary's got to travel while she's pregnant. I just can't imagine that. I mean, when you're nine months pregnant, pregnant, you stay close to your doctor, you know? You stay near Amanda, Polly, and um, close to the hospital. In fact, you can't even fly in the third trimester, I'm told, without a letter from your doctor saying there's not a risk for you to have a baby, have your baby within 72 hours, but Mary made that trip. Maybe she walked some, maybe she rode a, a horse or a donkey all the way down 80 miles. And um, when they got there, there was no room for them. All the Holiday Inns and Motel Sixes, they were all booked up. And finally they knocked on a door and this nice man said, well, we're full, but you could sleep in the barn out back. And they went and they slept and they, she had baby Jesus and they laid him in a feeding trough in a manger. And Joseph did not consummate the marriage until she gave birth to a son and they gave him the name Jesus. You know? And then I'm going to summarize chapter two very quick. Um, the Magi come, and I would imagine this was a great um, comfort and gave them confidence that what the angel had told them were true because these Magi from the East, they were kingmakers, you know? There were two big rival powers. Rome controlled the world, but in the East, in Persia, um, and these Magi had a long history. They were actually a tribe. And they go all the way back to Daniel. And Daniel, I think this is where they learned that a king would be born because Daniel said in Daniel chapter 7, verse number 13, In my vision at night I looked, and there was one before me like the Son of Man, like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power over all nations and peoples of every language. They worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. 
Well, they had learned this and passed it down from generation to generation. And God provided a star. And so you have the homage of the Magi and you have the hatred of Herod, who is not a legitimate king. He's not even an Israelite. He is a, an Edomite. And when he looked out his shutters of his window and he saw these Magi, these kingmakers coming from the east, and their cavalry that rode with them. You know, those little pictures on those cards is not what Herod saw, those three wise men. This was an imposing force and everybody in Jerusalem knew about it. And uh, he asked the prophets, where is this Messiah going to be born? And um, they said in Bethlehem, Micah chapter five, you see this whole thing is filled. It's we prophecy is from the Old Testament is woven through the fabric of Matthew 1 and 2. And Herod wanted to kill him, but the Magi worshiped him and gave gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which is what they probably used when the angel told them to escape to Egypt because Herod was going to kill the baby. And they would exchange that to fund their trip and go all the way down to Egypt. Now, many people think, Egypt, what are they doing in Egypt? Well, there was a huge community of Jews. In fact, in 31 AD, um, um, I, was, I read where there was almost a million Jews. The, the city of Alexandria was there. There was a great library there. That's where the Septuagint was uh, translated. So there was a a lot of support in Egypt and many people fled. In fact, I'm told the Qumran community who were responsible for the Dead Sea Scrolls even went down to Egypt and they stayed until, until they were told by the angel that they could come back. But before that, before they came back, Herod went into Bethlehem and then the vicinity and he killed all the baby boys that were two years and younger so terrible I think about the child abuse today and how children are hurt these babies were ripped from their mother's arms and killed it was a picture of what happened in Egypt you know during Moses when he was a baby and Pharaoh, another king, gave orders to kill. In fact, the picture of Egypt and Israel's deliverance, Israel is called God's son and God's servant in Isaiah, but God's son. He, he called them out of Egypt, and that's what he quotes from um, in, in um, Hosea chapter 11. I, I call out of Egypt, I call my son. And... Um, and then another prophecy was fulfilled in verse number 14 from Jeremiah 31 about uh, voices heard in Ramah weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they were no more. And um, so all of these prophecies are being fulfilled. I don't even think Joseph and Mary understood all of that, but God was in control of all of this from Caesar Augustus all the way down to all of the events that were surrounding in Jesus and his early and his birth and in his early childhood. And then he returned to Nazareth which was to fulfill what was said through the prophets that he would be called Nazarene. There's a lot I could say about that, but I don't have time, I'm running out of time. But I do wanna say this, that Matthew has chosen many prophecies and they are so unique and complex that there is no way that this could have happened by chance or by accident. And when you think about 
the 332 prophecies that Jesus fulfills, it absolutely boggles the mind and it convinces us that Jesus is the Christ. Just think about those four prophecies that are associated with his birth. They're, there's, they're all focused on Jesus. They all focus on the Messiah and four geographical locations, Bethlehem, Egypt, Ramah, and Nazareth. Most people, when they're born, they're associated with one place, Boone County, <laughs> Madison, West Virginia, growing up on, you know, at just one place. But Jesus is associated with all four, just like the Bible says, all four of these things took place and that is connected with his birth and the chance of anybody being able to fulfill all four prophecies is just astronomical. It would be impossible. And it's one of the greatest evidences that Jesus is the Messiah, the King of Kings. Yep. So here's the takeaway. One takeaway. His royal genealogy as son of Abraham, son of David, his virgin birth, his the fact that he was born in Bethlehem, worshiped by magi, kingmakers, his escape to Egypt and how he was called out of Egypt, the slaughter at Ramah in the vicinity of Bethlehem, and his return to Nazareth proves that he is Messiah and King. And that little baby King that they're worshiping, don't just think of him in the manger, in a cradle, but I want you to see him as he is now in Revelation chapter five. It's the last scripture I'm gonna read. Then I looked, and this is baby Jesus exalted in heaven. You see, he goes from the cradle to the cross. You see, I've got the Merry Christmas, the manger and the cross behind me, but that's not where it stops. He ascends to heaven. And he is surrounded. And as the Magi worshiped him, listen to what the image or the vision is in heaven that John has. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 upon 10,000. They encircled the throne, the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice they, they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every living creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. So, oh man, the Bible is amazing. And it points to Jesus Christ and we worship him. So sing with me. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. God bless you all. We'll see you next Sunday. Merry Christmas. I love you all.